welcome to this evening's debate. Lovely to see you all here. And tonight's debate title is, What If We Really Wanted to Support Schools Facing the Greatest Challenge? Um, of course, this is a hugely important area, as I'll come back to in a sec. First of all, the usual housekeeping. We're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm sounds, we'll take the doors out to the right, out onto Bedford Way, or if necessary, the side doors and upper floor so that we can ac access the back of the building. Now, for our What If debate series, we're incredibly grateful to our speakers and our audiences and to the TES for partnering with us. <laughs> Ed Dorrell is sitting at the front supporting us as usual. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ed. <laughs> Together, we've generated some really impactful debate on the enduring challenges in education. And we're regularly uh, meeting audiences of several thousand on the live stream. A reminder to those watching today on the live stream are very much part of the proceedings and can submit questions to the panel via the usual hashtag, which is hashtag IOE debates on Twitter. Now, England's education system is famous for its long tail. Our highest performance Performing students tend to match the best in the world, but we have a large proportion who fare less well. And many of those young people are concentrated in the schools that perform least well on the national indicators and, of course, in Ofsted inspections. And in turn, many of these are concentrated in areas of deprivation. Now, of course, that's not a given. There are exceptions, and we have on our panel um, several colleagues who, will, who represent those exceptions, as we'll hear in a minute. But nevertheless, those are the broad trends, and there is, a, as you know, a wealth of research evidence documenting these trends as well. So raising the performance of schools that face the greatest challenge remains our greatest challenge. And this has long been a significant part of policy debate, of course. Progress has been made, but it's been frustratingly slow and precarious. And as I say, these trends remain. So we have a chance this evening to ask, are we essentially on the right track, or is it time to think more radically to crack this problem? How far can we get with schools-based interventions? Again, we have these long-standing questions about whether schools can do it all, what else we need to see in the system, and so forth. Um, we've asked our panelists this evening, if you were Secretary of State, what would you do? So while they're thinking about that testing question, um, I can say a little about our panelists. First of all, Sir David Carter is National Schools Commissioner, as you know. Prior to that, having trained here at the IOE, fond alumni, uh, David was a teacher and then a head teacher, interspersing that with roles at the DfE. He went on to be CEO of a federation of schools, the Cabot Learning Federation, then a regional schools commissioner for the South West. And David was one of the first national leaders of education, and the Cabot Learning Federation was one of the first teaching schools. David received a knighthood for his services to education in 2013. Vic Goddard is head teacher of Passmore's Academy in Harlow, and you may also know him from the fantastically inspiring Channel 4 series, Educating Essex. Starting out as a PE teacher, Vic rose quickly up the ranks to become a school leader, gaining experience in the UK and overseas before taking up the helm at Passmore's and becoming probably the most famous head teacher in the UK today. Lucy Heller is chief executive at ARC. ARC's now a, a network of 35 schools, educating more than 21,000 pupils. As my own chain effects reports for the Sutton Trust attest to, it's one of the top performing multi-academy trusts in the country and is particularly successful in transforming the attainment levels of disadvantaged pupils. Under Lucy's leadership, ARC has got behind some important new ventures from Maths Mastery to the Children's Social Work Training Programme, Frontline. And finally, Sam Friedman is Executive Director of Participant Impact and Delivery at Teach First. 
Prior to that, he was senior policy advisor at the DfE during Michael, Michael Gove's tenure as Secretary of State, and before that, head of education at the think tank Policy Exchange. He's also a director of Floriat <coughs> Education, which runs two primary schools in London, and a governor of Woodside High School in Tottenham. So I can, you can see that we have some really esteemed panellists um, and a wonderful wealth of experience to draw on today to answer the question. And we're going to start with Lucy. Lucy. Thank you, Becky. Um, you will have, first of all, I start with an apology, which is that, as you can tell from my voice, um, Vic and I are both down in the quarantine end of this with, with the lurgy section of the, of the panel. So I'm going to be brief in the hope that my voice will, will hold out. So I think I have to start by, in a sense, saying um, the ministerial role is not grand enough to solve this problem. If I were Minister of State for Education, I don't think that I could really provide the support to the, that schools need because fundamentally the schools facing the great, greatest challenges are those that face the basic uh, problems of inequality in our country. And I don't imagine that the Department for Education is going to be in a position anytime soon to address those in any very deep or meaningful way. But in the spirit of sort of provocation, I put out <laughs> two modest proposals that if I were emperor, I would be interested in seeing <laughs> enacted. Um, and the first of those is for a national teaching service and saying, it seems to me, fundamentally we come back time again and again saying it's all about the teaching. It's really just about what happens in those classrooms. If you're not, that is, addressing the more fundamental question of sort of societal inequality, the thing that's going to make the most difference is having the best people in those classrooms. And it is you know, enduring the problem for the most challenging schools to get people there. Uh, we've had, and Sam and others have been very much part of Teach First, and there have been all sorts of initiatives that have done something to address this. But one of the problems is too often it seems to me that Teach First, which has done extraordinary work, ends up being a form of sort of VSI, voluntary service inland, <laughs> that we get the brightest and the best coming into teaching, and they've made a huge difference, and they get... They go out to the places that most need them, and then, like homing pigeons, after their two-year stint, they fly back to the bright lights of the metropolis. And the places which most need them are still left without the people that they, they need to make a difference to their students. So I would love to see a national teacher service, a sort of effectively a SWAT team of experienced teachers and leaders and this isn't really about money, it is partly about a sort of Teach First style missionary zeal, but for the government to decide that they wanted to invest in persuading people to take this up, and it would be a bit like national service, and to think critically, and money might be part of the attraction, but it would be signing up to go for fixed terms. So it's saying you're signing up for five years, and the two things I think that would make a critical difference would be one, real help and support with housing so that it's giving people an opportunity actually to be properly housed, to get a foot on the housing ladder, and probably also to look at how you managed it as a fixed-term contract so that people felt they weren't taking a career-damaging risk by dealing with the most challenging schools. I'm very conscious at the moment as someone who's obviously trying to attract and retain the best people, that increasingly what you hear from teachers and particularly from leaders is the sense that going into the most challenging schools is potentially career damaging. I think you have to take that risk away from people and say, we're making to you a commitment for the time. Come and serve your country and your community and make this commitment. And in return, we'll think about sort of how we can house you and how we can make sure that you have a rewarding period doing it. The other piece I would look at is on university access, and I would propose that Oxbridge, and I don't know exactly how one would work this, but say that you should do Oxbridge and Russell Group University places should be guaranteed for the top ranked at every school in the country. You may need to have some sort of basic requirement in kind of terms of A-level grades, but saying we're not going to be persuading sort of aspirant parents to go to their local schools to really get behind those schools unless you give some guarantee. I would be much tighter about saying that university admission should be based on taking the best 
the best performing students from each and every school, not just um, the select few. Those are my modest proposals to start us off for this evening. Thank you very much, Lucy. That's great. And Vic, next. Second person from Lurgy Corner. Do apologise. <laughs> I'm going to get through it, so it might not be very long, but I'll get through it. Um, I think the reality... I thought I want to start with the reality of... I've worked in Harlow for 17 years. Um, now, the indicators we use for challenge and challenging schools often comes down to free school meals and, and, and that sort of income-generated deprivation. Um, I, wanted, I would want to open that conversation up. Yeah, I, Harlow is the most, was the most murderous town in the, in the country, most murderous place in the country last year, with more murders and attempted murders per head of the population. Those crime figures are national, they're everywhere. Those, they are part of the indicators. I think um, if we narrow it down just to free school meals, we will miss too many of the really needy people that we can change. That's the first thing. In reality, what does working in a challenging school mean? Well, it means often poor parental engagement um, unless they've got a complaint to make. That's the reality of teaching in a school like that. The other thing it means is often more poor behaviour choices from children and therefore an increasingly challenging classroom environment which is more stressful for teachers and creates more work after the every lesson. So that's the reality of what a challenging school is. If you ask a classroom teacher that we think is working in a challenging environment, what does it mean to them? I reckon that every single one of them would mention probably both of those things, but definitely one of them. Um, so what's, what's the consequences? I mean, the evidence is out there of the consequences of, of choosing to work in that environment. Um, Education Policy Institute, back in 2016, less likely to get a good or an outstanding, more likely to get an RI. That's not going to encourage teachers to work there. Um, Becky Allen from Education Data Lab, 1.7... Oh, sorry, sorry now <laughs> IOE, sorry. But back when she wrote this, she was Education Data Lab. Um, 1.7 times more likely to, for teachers to move on in schools in challenging environments than you are in the top 20%. What does that mean? Well, more, more NQTs, more unqualified teachers, more PE teachers teaching maths and science, which if you don't believe that's happening, you haven't been in a school in a challenging environment in the last two years. Um, and of course, we try to, to skill them up. They do a whole week of, uh, of intensive support, and then they can stand in front of a GCSE class. Um, DF, even the DfE's own research back in 2013, 70% more likely to, to leave, teachers more likely to leave schools outside the top 20% of the, the, the affluent areas. Um, and even, even Amanda Spielman, it takes longer to improve challenging schools. If you put that in the context of extreme exam changes over the last few years, but we're expected to change those instantly. So that's the reality as a head who, and a teacher who's worked in that environment now for a number of years. It feels a challenge. It's not just about numbers. It feels more challenging. It takes more time. So my, I have a few, actually. I've, I, had, I did manage to come up with a few different suggestions. I think they probably come increasingly more challenging as I go down them. Um, the first <laughs> one was we need to look at the investment in, in preschool. It actually, if you want to improve schools in challenging environments, we've got to start preschool. We've got to look at those environments where there isn't vocabulary rich. And if we're completely honest, what's the biggest thing that would unlock all of these schools? Well, it's increased literacy levels of the young people in them. That's what it would be. And how do we do that if they're coming from a, an, an area where there's not a book in their house? You know, people aren't reading, there's no role models around them. That's a challenge. We at Passmore's have decided that we've moved our library into the corridors, so all of the books that are related to English are in the English corridor, all the books related to science are in the science corridor. There is no librarian, and if a young person wishes to borrow one, they borrow one. If they don't bring it back, they've got a book in their house. It's cheaper than employing a librarian, if I'm completely honest. So things like we have to tackle as early as possible, waiting for it to be at school age, especially secondary, but even at primary, is too difficult. Um, Actually knowing what works, the education, the EF have done loads of stuff around that. I've, we did a disadvantage audit just recently, and the challenge around knowing which of the multitude of things we're doing actually makes a difference. That's why education research is so difficult, because you don't change one thing, you change everything. What am I throwing at my year 11s this year after some challenging results last year? Well, everything, kitchen sink, cupboard, wardrobe, the works. Um, the government and the Secretary of State particularly needs to take responsibility very similar to, to Lucy around teacher recruitment. 
what happened to teacher pools that used to be run by a local authority. My brother got given a house <laughs> when he started, exactly what Lucy said. You know, he was in a pool for his, his local authority, and that, that sort of turnover of staff was very relevant. I'm going to come to the, the big elephant in the room, that a one-size-fits-all approach from Ofsted. We want to be held accountable. As an education leader, I want to be held accountable. But it doesn't need to look like it looks now. That needs to have some radical thoughts about it. The drive around holding people to account rather than supporting schools to change, that need, there needs to be a flip on that completely. A differentiated approach, a more mature approach. Um, money may help attract teachers. Wages may make a difference, but actually the biggest single thing that will help me recruit and keep staff in my school is to force me to give them less contact time. If the government said to me, this much money means you can only give your teachers 80% contact time, 70% contact time, because the stuff they need to do after lessons is harder, is longer. The phone calls to parents to truly engage them, writing home. So let's make schools give teachers more time. That will also then help the work-life balance, of course. Um, I'm going to mention it. Grammar schools, well, they're a disaster. If we're talking about this topic, then let's, not, let's just literally put that to bed. I know the current Secretary of State is ex-grammar school, but the biggest single thing that could damage my school is putting a grammar school in the town because it's already impossible to recruit. recruit. So if you can be worse than impossible, that's where we'd be. Um, there are, it, and if we're being really radical, if there are places of long-term disadvantage young people, long-term challenge young people, then let's open a, a comprehensive state boarding school in every town and remove some of those children from that toxic environment, giving them an environment that's supportive, challenging, but also focused on giving them the right environment about educational attainment, and then we will overcome some of those challenges at home. I know that there will be people thinking, those poor parents, etc., and I accept that. That's, this is not normal but actually if we've got embedded if we've got embedded challenge then let's change that environment those young people are in to give them a chance to thrive and, and flourish done that's my lot got through it phew <laughs> thank you very much for so David. So next. Um, good evening everybody um, shortly after i became a head in 1997 the specialist schools and academies trust created a program that was targeted at challenging schools 21 years later here we are this evening having a similar debate and asking similar questions to those that were posed two decades ago. And it's not that the system hasn't talked about this. It's more a product of us understanding the nature of educational challenge better and the degree to which we as leaders in the system are capable of using evidence-based improvement. What actually works to provide support and capacity for the schools? It's for this reason that I've been talking a lot of the last year about improvement trajectories that schools are on so that we understand the difference between a leadership team doing the right things but results haven't caught up yet. The lag between the right strategy and the outcomes is the, is the Venn diagram, if you like, of where I think we need to look to provide our support. The concept of challenge, I think, has to be seen through the lens of accountability as well, and I accept that as National Schools Commissioner, this is a space that I sometimes play in myself. <laughs> But as we think differently about shifting the dial from intervention after schools fail to supporting schools better to prevent failure, I've been describing the work that I and the regional schools commissioners do as being about fewer schools failing and more schools helping. That seems to me to be the beginning of the policy solution uh, should it be my job to do it. And as the person that probably is the closest to the Secretary of State, and given he's been in the job for three weeks, I'm not keen to get into that space too quickly this evening. But I think there are two fundamental questions that are related to the concept of challenge. And the first one is about how do we define it? And I think there are four quick ways we could look at defining the word challenge in this debate. The challenge of context, but we need to avoid it sounding like an excuse because it isn't, but it's real. The challenge of complexity, where leaders are building strategies for improvement on multiple levels. The challenge of ensuring that children make progress from their starting points, which of course is a challenge for every school. And the challenge of seeing education as a means of building community confidence and deepening community cohesion, where the schools we worried about today are sometimes the weakest schools from 1980, when the parents of our children today have the same experience. How do we break that cycle? But there's a consequence of not thinking differently. It's a consequence of not thinking differently, which is why I wanted to take part in this debate this evening. If we don't think differently, we see an even greater reliance on intervention. If we don't think differently, the very children on our education system who need the best teachers and leaders won't get them. 
If we don't think differently, we'll have a never-ending cycle of negative courage, coverage of schools that at their best shape and lead their communities. So my solutions to thinking about this would include these following things. I think we have to deepen even more the collaborative culture in the education system. We need the educational partners in our cities, towns and villages to combine their leadership brains into a community plan that leaves no school left behind. This brain comes from the combined wisdom of schools, of colleges, of universities, yes, the independent sector and dioceses. So when a child is vulnerable, what we do in schools and what families do is they wrap that child in care, love and support. We have to do the same thing with the schools that are most vulnerable as well. My second point is that we should publish results in smaller cohorts of schools so that the true picture of performance in an area is seen and where the celebration is focused on all children in a postcode and not just those educated in the best school or the best mat. This way the collaborative gene can grow in such a way that mats work with other mats and the best local authority schools who don't want to become an academy, don't want to lead a mat, can contribute in a really powerful way. We should look beyond the headline judgments in my view so we look at attendance, exclusions, the percentage of children who are still on roll in year 11 that were there in year 7, the intake and destination data, so that the educational journey is seen as exactly that. It's a journey. I'd encourage a closer focus on the 10-year achievement metric. The benefit of many great educational experiences can be seen in terms of what it leads to, and how does a 25-year-old benefit from what they did in their years of compulsory schooling, and how do they use that to cement their future? Perhaps the school that we're describing today as being challenged, we would look at differently in 2025 if we look at what the product of their education was for those young people in their communities. It's one of the reasons why I'm remaining an advocate of the opportunity area strategy that our former Secretary of State, Justine Greening, was so committed to developing. Because educational leadership, no matter how good it is, on its own cannot transform communities. It has to be a partnership with other vital public services who all contribute to the mobility challenge. The strongest schools with the best performance should be tasked with appointing teachers that can be deployed across the local family of schools. I hear too many stories of successful schools over-recruiting in shortage areas for themselves, leaving the very schools that need the best teachers having to make do and mend. We need to describe the best schools not just in terms of their own performance, but what they do for the other schools that surround them. And we need to use collaboration to incentivise retaining leaders and teachers in the schools that are <coughs> hardest to work in. The principle of educating a city was something that the MAT CEOs, teaching school alliances and local authority heads in Bristol signed up to in a big way 15 years ago. We tried to be sector blind and that nobody worried about the type of school that they worked in, but we were committed that every child in Bristol mattered and what mattered most was that they attended a good school. My final point is that we need to embed research and reflection as the DNA of our profession and share the evidence as widely as possible. We need to see research as a genuine and real contributor to school improvement, focusing on what needs to improve today, for what next practice tomorrow will look like. I hope we continue to support research schools and that those providers who are successful when they bid for strategic school improvement money, TLIF funding or MAT development bids are required as a part of that to write us up a summary for us of what they have learned from the activities the grant funded, and we share it more widely. And that evidence needs to be made available <coughs> two clicks maximum on a website that every teacher in the country can learn from. So this, I think, will be a long road to success. Educational success is not about quick wins, but we need to talk a message of hope and optimism where we see every child as having potential and every school as a champion of great learning. The potential of the child should matter exactly the same whether that child becomes a writer, mathematician, scientist or economist, or a musician, artist, actor or dancer. And when we make progress in this respect, we'll stop talking about supporting schools in challenge and instead talk about the communities of learning that they are proud to be a part of. That way we will see schools that parents want to send their children to, teachers who want to work in them, and where community cohesion is really about lifelong learning. Thank you, David. That's a tour de force. Sam. Uh, thank you very much. So when I, when I saw this sort of brief, I, I, I put my old policy advisor hat on um, and started thinking of a, a lengthy list of, of, of technocratic things that could be done, you know, given all the constraints of politics and what's politically possible and what the media will let you get away with and what's fundable under our current sort of still bit of austerity and so on. 
and I came up with a, with, a, with a nice long list of things that I think would make a would make a real difference. You know, there's there's some real big problems in our system at the moment. Teacher recruitment being one I think about a lot, given given my, my day job. Um, we could do things like um, paying off student loans uh, for people who come into the profession. That would go a long <coughs> way to creating an extra incentive. Have higher starting pay for teachers. We can uh, do a wholesale reform of school directs. Um, I think that would that would help help a lot. There's things we could do around teacher retention, which is why teacher recruitment is such a problem because we can't keep people in. So there's things around the accountability system that need changing. We need to we need to um, make sure that some of the things that Vic was talking about, those pressures of of Ofsted and so on, aren't being passed down into the into the classroom and putting people off from working in the most challenging schools, putting leaders working uh, off working in our most challenging schools. There's all sorts of things around funding and regulation. We've got a national funding formula. Um, there's also there's tweaks I'd make to that. There's, uh, there's still a big question to, uh, to answer about um, whether the future of the academy system, it was sort of going in one direction. Nicky Morgan had a white paper in 2016 that was said everyone's going to be an academy. That was binned. We haven't, we haven't sort of got a, a vision for where the, um, where, where the academy system's going, where, where um, uh, sort of, uh, David's team and how, how that needs to sort of work with schools to sort of properly regulate the system. And there's, there's other issues that go beyond, <coughs> beyond schools, there's things like mental health and the massive underfunding of CAMs and, and the kind of problems, the day-to-day -day problems that's causing for schools in the most challenging circumstances, um, uh, which, which are all really big problems. And then I had another look at my brief and it said I needed to be radical. Okay, I'm, I'm trained as a civil servant, how do I be really radical? <laughs> Um, and uh, how, how, how do I um, go beyond what, what, what we sort of think of as being possible in the sort of day-to-day -day discussions I have around policy? Um, so I came up with two, two things that I, I believe really would make a, a big difference, two policy packages that I think would make a, a really significant difference to, to the to schools with the greatest challenges, and perhaps ones that we have been off the table in, um, in, uh, uh, in, sensible, in sensible policy debates for, for too long. The first, I think, is a genuinely comprehensive education system. I think that we need a package to get us to a genuinely comprehensive education system. And I think that is actually a bit of a political window opening for this now. Um, I think one of the big things that's changed in the 15 years I've been working in education is um, you don't actually have the sort of negative public profile associated with comprehensives that you did back then. You don't have every day you open the papers and there's a sort of series of negative stories about failure and, and, and um, bad behavior. Um, there is a better brand. If you look at the data, most parents, 90% of parents are happy with their school. Education is way down the list of things that are people's political priorities at the moment. That's actually a good thing. It means that, the, that people are quite happy. So there's a real chance to make an argument that, that it's working and we need to uh, make it fair across the whole country. So let's end grammar schools for good. Let's get rid of them. Stop. Let, let's, let's move from the argument about having new ones. Let's get rid of the existing ones. Um, how, how would that transform education in places like Medway? It would be, it would be transformational. Let's have a, a really punitive tax on private education um, so that, um, uh, that everyone, including the upper middle classes, have to really engage with the, with the state system. Um, where they do, it definitely um, helps to um, uh, support schools um, that they're, that they're um, going into. Let's, let's have really tough regulation on illegal exclusion. This is a growing problem in our system at the moment. Um, you know, it's linked to some of the other, other problems I was talking about around accountability and so on, but it, it's just, it just shouldn't be allowed to happen. We shouldn't have schools off-rolling uh, young people because they don't want to educate them rather than because they've been um, too badly behaved. So let's um, create a new proper role for local authorities, having lost their, their sort of older roles that they've had in our system. Let's make them real champions of young people, particularly vulnerable young people and challenging um, schools. Let's make sure that um, that they have all the powers and duties that they, that they need to, uh, to, to prevent illegal exclusion from happening, to prevent schools from fiddling the admission system, um, and to make sure that every child gets a completely fair chance. Um, and my, my sort of second uh, proposal, uh, my second package, is around ch changing social mobility to be about communities rather than individuals. Um, <coughs> I think that this sort of concept that we've sort of all talked about for a long time um, social mobility has actually been really damaging um, for, for schools. Um, the, this idea, we've actually got really good at it. We've got very good at, um, you know, results have got up, more, more young people are in sixth form education. Uh, universities are now very focused on, 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 on contextual admissions and getting people from um, more challenging backgrounds. You've got great organisations like Sutton Trust into university helping, helping talent spot around the country. We've got good at rescuing people from their community. 
um, and, um, and sending them into to higher education. Um, but that's actually making it harder and harder and harder for the schools and for the people left in those communities. We're creating a more and more divided country, which can be seen um, in the political situation we now find ourselves in um, post-Brexit. Um, and uh, if we're going to start breaking down that challenge, we need to think about how we, cha how we change communities, not how we change <coughs> individuals' life, life chances. Um, and, and the biggest sort of predictor of whether any particular town or, or area is going to be on, on which side of divide they're going to be? Are they going to be on the sort of successful, educated, urbanite divide, or the or the or the left behind divide? Is whether there's a university there? Um, that's 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 the, the single biggest predictor. Um, and if our Russell Group universities can open campuses in Nottingham, in um, in uh, China and Thailand and Malaysia, they can open them in Grimsby and Clacton and Doncaster and Rotherham and Blackpool. Um, so let's get. Um, higher education into these places in the same in the same on the same site. Let's have um, uh, technical institutions. Um, let's not call them polytechnics again, but almost a rebirth of that idea of having really really well funded um, uh, elite technical institutions on the same site as the higher education institutions, um, which can be sort of the the, the central <coughs> focus for apprenticeships in the area and for all technical training and for all adult training. Um, let's build business parks around those campuses, which have incredibly um, a generous tax breaks for any businesses that want to work there. We can fund it by the punitive tax on private schools. Um, and, uh, and let's really um, change communities rather than just individuals. And while we're at it, while we're at it let's move um, Parliament to Sheffield, because that would have a big impact <laughs> as well. There you go. There's Radical. That's Radical. Yay. Thanks to our panel. <laughs> Well, that was truly stimulating, and um, I think we can all agree that there were some genuinely radical ideas in there, but I really like the fact that they were both radical and practical. Um, some of them even strongly research evidenced. Uh, I'm thinking of, of grammars, of course, um, but also the evidence on the effect of private schooling and, of course, the point about the, 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 the issue about high-quality teaching and this being um, the most transformational element in terms of um, student results and particularly for dis students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, so a really good provocation for us. Um, we've also heard, I think, a lot about um, the impact of context, um, that it's really uh, difficult, although um, the challenge has, has been, you know, we've been reminded that we mustn't use context as an excuse. Nevertheless, um, it's come through from uh, all the speakers that uh, schools' environments profoundly impact um, their capacity uh, to support their students. Um, and so we have also then, when we think about the context, we've heard um, Sir David's really inspiring challenge and vision around collaboration, school-to-school -school support, schools supporting one another to develop. Um, we've also heard quite a lot about the disincentives for that to happen the strong accountability that drives us to look after our own schools and prioritise results in our own schools first and foremost. Um, the issue about, um, you know, poaching or, or, or concentration of particular resources, particularly when resources are scarce, and I'm thinking of teacher shortages and so on. Um, and we know, don't we, again from the research about the issues about access to schools, um, purchasing into catchment areas, um, the impact that that can have on school <coughs> roles, um, so that schools get into a sort of cycle of struggle and decline uh, where, where other schools thrive. So I guess where I'm going is to um, really ask uh, our panel members about this issue about the quasar market and whether we can really have uh, both competition and collaboration operating effectively together. So David, maybe you'd like to respond first. I, I had a feeling that was coming my way <laughs> to start with. Um, well, whether, whether you can or not, we have it. And, and, and that's the challenge. And that was my point about trying to look differently about how we share with the public how schools are doing. Because um, in, in a community, when you rank all the schools, uh, which the local press will do anyway, you, you create a disincentive to go and work in those schools, and parents have a different view about 
about what the world looks like in terms of the kind of education a child is going to get. So um, we have it. And our competition is healthy. And even if we legislated for it, it would still be there. So it's, 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 a, it's an absolutely fundamental part of human life that, uh, that, that, that people want to do well. Um, sometimes that means they want to do better, but it means they, they want to be successful. But that concept of the educating a city analogy, which I described in Bristol, was incredibly powerful. Um, Bristol in 2003 was, was very much about the early academy, well, it wasn't 2000, it was later than that, but 2005 actually, early academy program. But the leaders got together and made the decision that wh whatever type of school they were, we were, we were not going to compete negatively. We were not going to do each other down. We were going to continue to work with the same people we'd worked with six months earlier. And so I do think there is hope for me around collaboration. But it's one of the reasons why I think collaboration, we have to really explore it because it works on different levels. So of course, I, I believe really strongly that the multi-academy trust is at its best and I stress at its best, a really powerful vehicle for school improvement. But it isn't the only collaboration. It isn't the only mechanism to get people working together and sharing. And collaboration can be about taking joint responsibility for children in different schools, or it could be about actually just having a conversation about how we are going to make this profession great again. One of the challenges that I think that too much competition has created is a lack of joy in the system. And I think it's meant that that probably manifests itself in uh, people's views about whether the type of school they want to work in is right for them. But it's one of the reasons why I, I think the arts as a curriculum subject have such a powerful role to play, because I think it brings joy to schools. Um, I know that we could have a debate about whether that's true <coughs> in science and technology, I'm sure it is. But as a musician, I'm going to say that, the, 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 the art. But I, but, but I think there's something about how collaboration can be seen as an antidote to fierce competition. And it's one of the reasons why I talk about mats have got to work better together, teaching schools have got to work together, and we have to find a way to join this system up. And I think that's one of the real incentives that uh, the politicians in the next 10 years are going to have to grip and do well with it. Thank you, David. And Sam, in your sort of, you've seen the, I won't say you were the architect, for you, but you <laughs> were certainly uh, present at the time in relation to the, the, the system that we, we have at present. You know, what are your thoughts on collaboration and competition? <clears throat> I mean, I think, um, same, same, as, same as David said, you, you, can't, you can't have only one or the other. There's no system or, uh, in the world that has only one or the other. You'd have to literally allocate every child to a school regardless of parental interest whatsoever in order to have a sort of system with no competition um, and nowhere does that um, uh, uh, but but any any in any sector in any business sector organizations that are successful work out when collaborations in their interest and 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 it's um, helping schools to understand um, that collaboration is usually in their competitive interest um, depending on exactly how it works um, uh, and if they don't do it, they're going to be the, they're going to suffer. So I actually, they often point in the same direction. I don't think they're they're as uh, contradictory as they're, they're, they're sometimes they're sometimes posed. Um, and I think, uh, but I, what I do think is, if you are going to have a system in which there is competition, which is inevitable, you have to have really careful, tough regulation of the right things um, in order to ensure fairness. And one of the big mistakes of the um, uh, it's been around in English education for a while, but I think exacerbated by the academy policy was to was to give schools control over things they shouldn't have control over, like admissions, um, and too much control over exclusions as well. Um, and that's why I sort of said in, 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 in my remarks that 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 could be a real um, a real job for local authorities to do, um, because. It's fine to say schools have a sort of uh, can compete on curriculum, on staffing, on how they spend their money. You do not want them competing on which kids they have. Um, and as long as you can, as long as you can solve that, then I think um, the the I'd, I'd let some um, people work out when to collaborate in their own interest. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Lucy, I can probably uh, more easily ask you than David. Um, in your view, why such divergence in the performance of different multi-academy trusts? No, I think actually probably David <laughs> probably can answer that more easily than I can. I can. Um, you know, because I think in any um, autonomy is always the license to do sort of well, but it's equally the license to do badly. And in any <coughs> sort of free system, you would expect to see a range of, of performance. And I think you see this across the world. I don't think I or anybody particularly believes that any structural 
sort of device is the silver bullet that's going to magically improve performance. The range is as wide as you would see in, main in the maintained school system. I think all academies have done is sort of open up the range of providers. Right. David, you wanted to join in there. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm really happy to take that question because I spent most of my, my, my I days thinking about it. I thought it might be politically sensitive for you to comment. I, I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> uh, I think there are four reasons why mats fail. Um, and the, these are not in rank order, although a number one is pretty much common in all of them. Number one is there's no school improvement plan. The school improvement plan is the sum of what the schools decide they're going to do. The best, the best multi-academy trusts have a really cohesive plan about how they're going to support their schools, and it's flexible enough to meet the needs of different schools. So uh, when, when Lucy and I were in a meeting last week, the ARC school improvement plan is absolutely brilliant and fits the bill for all of the schools and the challenges they have. That's number one. The second one is weak mats have weak governance. Um, that, that's, that, that's just a fact. Um, but governance at every level, on a very simple level, they haven't explained to the local governing body that they're not a governing body anymore. They haven't explained what their scheme of delegation is. They haven't explained what the role of a local academy board is in a multi-academy trust. Three things, that's what, that's what it is. Number one, what's the experience of the children? What's the experience of the staff? And what's the experience of parents? If you start from that, you have a role for the academy board, which the main multi-academy trust board couldn't do. The third one, um, this, 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 is, this, is, this is more complex, but it's this notion of mats being based upon, come and join us and we'll leave you alone. Uh, it's, it's too much autonomy. So actually, you know, irrespective of what you bring to this organisation, I don't necessarily mean you're Ofsted, great, but what you bring to this organisation, we aren't going to challenge you. Now, I'm not advocating that we go immediately to the other end of the standardisation spectrum, but there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that the trusts that in the tables that came out last week that are making that progress have gripped that issue about what is the educational delivery going to be. And the fourth one is about communication. Um, I, you know, I, I had a really, really good debate, but it was a tough one at the Education Select Committee before Christmas about this whole notion of parents' engagement with multi-academy trusts. Now, I understand that the parent puts their child on the school bus in the uniform that they've chosen for their child to go to. So the school will always be more important than the mat. But a mat should also be driving some of the values <coughs> and the beliefs of what's happening in those schools. And if you don't tell parents what it is, you're going to have a disconnect between it. So, I mean, I, I think there's a few more things, but those will do for now. <laughs> Thank you. And just to um, make sure that we've included all the panellists. Um, Feel free to ignore No, no, me. no. I I, 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 I'm, I'm mindful of your, of your ill I'm very happy to hear these brilliant people. No, I, I wanted to ask you, um, from your perspective, what incentives do you think are needed to get the most effective teachers into the schools that need them most? Hmm. Can I just... I meant to mention safeguarding in my earlier bit. So the fact that safeguarding is every five years in some schools, especially in changing circumstances, is a disgrace. It needs to be centralised alongside admissions and exclusions mm. because actually they are more vulnerable by nature and therefore if they're not safeguarded, then that's our first and most important thing we do as leaders. So I had to say that because it was annoying me. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to um, recruitment, you know, I've been advertising, if any of you are looking for jobs and you <laughs> teach English, Math, Science or MFL, wonderful, you're well done, you've been successful. Um, <laughs> you're shortlisted. Yes, you're yeah. in, you're in, don't worry, have you got a pulse? Um, in reality, I think it's, it's about understanding the pressures of working in those environments. Now, those, those, those pressures come from accountability, come from poor choices by school leaders, often driven by accountability. But... It, it, for most people, it comes down to time, time to do the job. Teachers generally go into the profession because they want to make a difference. And when they see that they can't make a difference because there's too much stuff to do and too much time going on, they become frustrated and they leave. We have to give teachers time to do the jobs in the most difficult places. And going back to what I said earlier, ensuring that they have enough non-contact time, enough time to phone parents, enough time to plan outstanding lessons, enough time to write those postcards home to say to Johnny, you're doing brilliantly even if you think you can't. All of those things will make the biggest difference to the children and an enormous dis difference to the pressures that teachers feel, especially when you're going to have younger teachers in those sorts of environments by default. We've got to give schools in those situations time from Ofsted to react to changes, but also just hours in the day where they can do the stuff they need to do. Thank you so much. So we've had some really good ideas there and we want to hear from the audience now in terms of both ideas and questions. And as usual, we'll take a couple at a time. So 
Questions? Anyone? One here. We've got three very close to one another. So it's very useful. Thanks. Um, building on Vic's point, I was just wondering where the panel stood on having non-teachers working as pastoral staff to take some of that um, phone calls home, safeguarding different things off teachers, or, you know, Vic's suggestion for, for more time to do it. Thanks very much. Uh, hiya. So I was just thinking... Partly to do with what we were just talking about with incentivising teachers and partly to do with the community stuff. Um, I wonder whether we could incentivise young students, school leavers, who um, could be maybe paid to go to university and paid for their PGCs to then come back to their schools or to within their community to then sort of be role models for their, for their sort of peers coming through. Thank you very much. And there was one more lady here just in front, sorry. Thank you. Um, so this is around teacher professional development in that in several studies over the last couple of years I've kept on coming across teachers who are saying my school won't let me out for professional development and part of the reason in maths education is they train me up, they make me very, very saleable, I won't stay. So we've got into this silly situation where schools are thinking competitively about professional development and not about enhancing the capacity of the system. So the question to the panel is, how could um, opportunities and structures and support for teacher professional development, which is desperately needed, particularly in these sorts of situations, be harnessed in ways which would be constructive for these particular channels? Thank you very much. So, um, anybody got a particular view on non-teachers and um, pastoral work? Vic, did you want to speak on that? Uh, ultimately, I think most schools, or lots of schools that, that I work with and have worked with have, um, have, have taken that step. Um, I look at my student, we have a step team at Pastoral it's Students Towards Exceptional Progress team. They're non-teachers. Inherently, they are going around and, and making sure the hot spots get cold and the cold spots are used. Um, I, it's about time, and I absolutely agree. Having having that capacity to deal with safeguarding issues, the moment a safeguarding issue happens in the first half an hour a day, I know my day's done. Um, and having people that have got suitable experience, often around mental health, often around that sort of stuff, to, to be able to have as a resource would be wonderful. Unfortunately, having made redundancies two years ago, um, having had to get rid of my full-time school counsellor, having had to get rid of my AAL coordinator and one person doing two jobs. Um, it will always come back to money, as sad as that is. But I think, I think lots of schools are, are attempting to do that within the envelope they've currently got. But it, I, I think the opportunity to do it more widely would be greatly appreciated. You wanted to say something? Yeah, and sense. interestingly, the, the colleague who spoke about um, getting ex-students to return, that is my only recruitment strategy. And I think you'll find for a lot of schools now, I, I would say that my town hasn't necessarily historically developed lots of teachers, um, but two thirds of my recruitment over the last three years have been ex-students. Now, that fills me with utter joy and utter despair in equal measures. Mm. Because when they were at school, I told them to go off and conquer the world. I told them to go off and, and see, you know, see the world, change things, write the songs, you know, whatever it may be. And they've come home and they've come back to the same place they were at. However, they've come back to my home, so that makes me really happy. Um, and, I, and, and I think probably is a measure of some of the success of my school in the fact that that's happening now, but also a bit sad that that's all I've got, that that's what I rely on. You know, we've got four trainees this year, three ex-students, four mm. trainees next year, three ex-students. Um, it, it becomes a, an increasing challenge, but I think, I think schools are inherently having to grow their own and that starts sometimes in year seven. Sam, did you want to say something about it from another yeah, on, on that one, um, we, a couple of years ago we did a research project on our, our teachers who succeed in the most challenging schools and one of the patterns we found is that they had come from those communities. Mm. Um, and there's definitely something about going back to where, where you've come from um, and feeling like you are part of a, a mission to, to rebuild mm. where you're from. Um, that um, gives people a bit of extra motivation and resilience. So, so I think that's the more we can do of that, and it's, I think, a recruitment strategy that everyone is now sort of looking at um, uh, seriously. 
Um, and I just kind of on the CPD point as well, a, a, a point which is that actually, um, I think that's probably about management more than CPD, CPD in that um, you can use professional development as a retention tool if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and um, and uh, if we can help support heads um, and senior leaders to understand how they can build career paths for teachers, that's actually probably the best, one of the best ways they're going to keep them. But that's always going to involve professional development. So I think actually you can flip that one on its head. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, Lucy, I'd, I'd just, um, I think, second that strongly, that I think on the whole, the heads who are resistant to providing CPD on the grounds that it's going to lead people to jobs elsewhere, or the people who are going to get left behind, it's absolutely the first thing you need. And you have to accept that in developing people, sometimes you hope and that they will go on to other and, and greater things, but that's part of the deal. CPD is part of the attraction, I think, for any teacher in a, in a good school, is that you're being developed and that sort of works on, on both sides. And I would say, again, like Vic, I'm very delighted that we now have, you know, the first of our schools direct people who come from our schools. I think it's a great thing that people are going back, not necessarily to their, the school they started from, but certainly from an art school and coming back to teach at other art schools is terrific. And interestingly, around professional learning, the, the interviews that we do with staff, or the questionnaires we do with staff, the one thing that makes them stay the longest is our investment in their professional learning. Um, and the days of one size fits all, everybody in the hall, let's all do the same thing, unless it's around safeguarding, should be very long time dead. And actually staff having the ability to reflect on where their strengths and weaknesses are, working on their weaknesses. And my job is to support the system. My job is to create a teacher that makes a magnificent difference in my school and then goes on and makes a magnificent difference somewhere else. And then that's how we could sh will approach it, but we could really do with the backfill. <laughs> we could really do with the other ones coming through underneath that. But I think schools that don't have retention issues, I think you'll probably find nine times out of ten, if, if you remove the, the leafy areas possibly, it's about their own investment in professional learning to kept staff there. Lucy, the only thing I just want to add quickly on that question about um, teachers coming back and not seeing as a failure, it seems to me it ties in with something that Sam was saying about seeing social mobility as about sort of a community. I think one of the problems about the whole language of social mobility is that it tends to talk about plucking, you know, the brilliant, the poor but talented out of their communities, that it's all about leaving behind. You hear lots of the conversation from ministers indeed about, you know, I was there and now, thanks to my university education, I got out. This shouldn't be what we're doing to our communities. The point is not to abandon the place you come from, but to be able to go back to live a rich and full life and for everybody, not just the sort of the most able to escape, for education to be delivering something for great education for everyone that allows their communities to flourish as is without an escape. Thanks, Lucy. And David? Yeah, very, very briefly, a couple of points. I'm probably going to give you the third version of the same story, which is in September 2012, um, I set up in the Cabot Federation for uh, Year 12 students, Teachers for Tomorrow program, um, which was basically about people as they started their sixth form career who, who said they wanted to teach. Um, and we ran it as a three-hour session on a Friday afternoon. Um, and we, we basically did very <coughs> similar things than we did with the PGC students. Um, and of course, I've left now uh, four years ago, but I understand that five of that first cohort are now teaching in Cabot mm -hmm. schools. So I, I absolutely believe in that growing your own model. And I think in, our, in your, your point about the CPD, I think, I think is a really interesting one. And I, I don't think I want to add into what Lucy Sam Wovic said on that, other than when I see really, really powerful CPD, often in multi, the strongest multi-academy trust, it has four features to it. One is there is a really clear sense that what you do in the first two years is fueling what the program will look like for the next eight. So they've got a 10 year plan about what that's gonna be like. So Sam's point about CPD and the retention factor is, for me is absolutely right. And, and, if you, and if you make that commitment to people in their first six months that we, this, look what we're gonna offer you in the next 10 years, I think that's a really powerful lever to stay. I think the second thing that I see is that when the training is really bespoke to the needs of the individual, but also to the classes that they're teaching, yeah. rather than just a generic piece about being a better geography teacher or something, I think that, that, that's, that's really good. And I think the fourth <coughs> one is, and, and, you're, and, you're, and I absolutely understand your point about how sometimes you go out to do CPD and people will, will, will see you and talent spot you. But that works the other way as well. That's a good thing too. And in the strongest multi-academy trust, I want the best teachers and leaders to play a role across more than one school. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a product of that.
Thank you. Another round of questions. And if you can start by saying who you are and where you're from. So we've got Ed and Toby. Who are they? Okay. Uh, Toby Greeny here from here at the Institute. I, I'm interested in the opportunity areas and just your thoughts on how far are they learning the lessons from the London Challenge and kind of other area-based initiatives. What would you do to beef them up even more to ensure their success? Thank you, Toby. And Ed? Sorry. I've got... I'm losing my voice slightly. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, normally, I, normally at events like this, I always want to move the conversation back to the workforce from structural stuff, but instead I'm going to do it the other way around. Um, and just ask about the sheer weight of accountability that schools now face in this country. Endless reinventing of the wheel. Um, not to be too pointed, uh, Sir David, um, RSEs carry out effectively inspections, um, often just weeks after Ofsted have done the same. Um, what should we do about it, in essence? <laughs> Thank you. And lady here, sir. <coughs> Hi, my name is Amy Shocker. I'm the founder of a charity called Invincible Me. Um, we're currently doing a pilot in um, primary school, 12 primary schools, with the Center for Inclusive Education at the IOE. So my question really, uh, Sam's the only one in his original comments that mentioned mental health. And so I'm just curious about your uh, feelings on, on what role that plays, not only for the children, but for the workforce. Um, and what you, if anything, you're doing for, in our schools or, or David, uh, in your schools. Thank you so much. So some really good questions there. Um, I'm going to hold the uh, accountability question for David for a minute. So who would like to speak on opportunity areas? Any first starters? So. Okay, I can have a go at opportunity areas. Um, so I think um, I, I definitely agree with the principle. Um, as, as I was saying in, in, in my comments at the beginning, I think um, we do need to think about communities rather than individuals. So it makes sense to focus on some of those communities. I think the choice of opportunity areas is slightly Odd. Some of them are, are, are a little odd. Um, West Somerset has one secondary school, so it's a, a bit, bit odd to focus on that one. Um, but uh, and there, there's none in the northeast, which again is a bit strange. So, 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 so geographically, they're not quite spread as, as I would have thought. Um, and, and, and some of them are really quite small, um, which I think limits limits capacity a bit. Um, I think um, also there is. Um, uh, a little bit too much focus on bringing together sort of trying to almost recreate that kind of collaborative spirit around London Challenge when um, London Challenge wasn't actually that collaborative, really. It was pretty directed by the Department for Education. Um, so I think there's, a, there's been a bit of a sort of misunderstanding of what London Challenge actually was in the approach to some, some of them. And it's not, and this is really hard to do, so I can sort of understand why, it's not really bringing in other services yet, um, like mental health, like social work, um, uh, and new services sort of in the areas. So, so that, I think it's a really promising um, initiative. I think there's, uh, it, it, needs a, it needs a bit more focusing um, to, to, to be successful, and it needs to sort of hit a lot more communities as well than, than the ones it's aimed at. Thanks, Sam. Lucy, um, I imagine that you and I are old enough to remember excellence areas and mm. excellence in cities and so on. We have seen geographical focused uh, initiatives like this before. Or what's your view of them? Mm, well, I don't know. We'll wait and see. We're involved in um, at least one of the opportunity areas. And I think it's, uh, I guess, exciting to get the sort of focus of government attention and possibly money. But it's tough. And I think and with Sam, I'm not sure that the lessons of London Challenge are necessarily applicable. London, I'm never quite sure what the lessons of London <laughs> Challenge were, other than that London is easier than most places on account of London's got all the pies. And the problem of the opportunity areas is precisely the reverse of that. Yeah. It's not where you're getting that kind of magnet for talent, and it's how you address those, those gaps. Mm. Thank you. OK. Um, I think the question was posed, what should we do about Ofsted? But, uh, but I take it, get looking that, given that I'm looking at you, David, you know, we're taking RSCs yeah. in the mix here as well. Well, um, I'll, I'll answer your direct question and, and, and help you with that, Ed, um, if, if I may. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think I do need to probably 
pick on maybe three or four areas on this one. I think the first one is about, so what's the, what's the difference between the role of Ofsted and RSCs, which lies, I think, at the heart of your question. Um, the, 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 the work that Amanda and I have done together since she came into post and the, uh, the, the, the really successful couple of away days we've had with Ofsted regional directors with my RSCs is really helping um, because it's clear that even if there's one person in the system is confused, we've got to do something about it. So I'm, I'm obviously not pushing back on, on that point. But there is a difference between our roles in that the <coughs> Ofsted's role is very much about diagnosing how that school is performing at this particular point in time. It is not the job of the RSEs to reinspect that school. It's the job of the RSEs to start looking at the, the, uh, the outcomes of that report from the point at which the report is published and work out whether that trust has got the capacity or not to improve its school, whether it's a standalone or a multi-academy trust. So that's the first point I'd say. In the past, there have undoubtedly been occasions when education advisors who are contracted as consultants to DFE to enable the RSCs to triangulate the data they're being told about where a trust is have sometimes visited in close proximity to an inspection. Um, my, my plan going forward is we, have now, we will now bring that to an end because the education advisors that work for the regional schools commissioners when they're being deployed must be uh, doing their work at the trust level. There is no point in, in having two bodies both working at school level because the downward pressure that creates on the system I think is part of the, of the workload challenge. So my view would be that multi-academy trusts work very closely with me, with RSCs and with education advisors and we would only go and visit a school for two reasons. One is because we think this trust is doing something amazing in our school and we need to find out what it is and, and learn from it. Or actually, to be blunt, we don't believe them and we think those kids are still vulnerable and we want to go and check. So I think there's a, there's a difference in tone around how that works. But I absolutely agree with you. You know, if, if a school gets a Section 8 inspection today, there is no point in the RSC visiting on Monday apart from the fact it's half term, but also, but, but also <laughs> because of the duplication. And, and Amanda Spiel and I are both very aware of, of that. That's a challenge for both of our organisations to get right. Um, and, and, and I really welcome the way that she and I have uh, worked together in the past 12 months to, to address some of those issues. Thank you, David. Um, Lucy and Vic, how does it feel to be on the receiving end? Oh, that's really cruel. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do this as politically as I can do. I've had um, two education advisor visits. One was wonderful, one wasn't. Um, one was about helping me improve my school and moving things forwards, and one was about weighing it like a pig. Um, and if I'm honest, didn't tell me anything I didn't know, but just made it feel like um, we were under pressure and wasn't helpful. So, I, but then just last week, I had a wonderful visit from one of our disadvantaged young people and what we could do to, to pair up with another school, etc. and that felt supportive and felt like it was going to make a difference so um, I think they it can be done right it has been done right but I think I, I echo some of Ed's concerns I've heard too many horror stories from from colleagues who think they're having an educational visit that's going to uh, that's going to help and ends up feeling like they're under huge amounts of pressure with an unannounced offset and I guess in um, I think in a general sense going back to some of the conversations that we had earlier about how do we attract and retain you know, great people in teaching? We do need to take the edge of some of the kind of high stakes um, accountability measures, it seems to, to me, that if we're looking at trying to redress that balance between sort of competition and collaboration, we need to do more to think about how you can have a richer, more holistic view of, of data. So I think, you know, picking up on some points Sam was making earlier about sort of exclusions, looking at admissions, looking at attendance, and trying to take some of the threat, the implied threat out. That said, I'm still very clear, I think there needs, you know, the department needs to be able to act briskly where schools need to be managed better. But I think there's probably too much weighing of the the pig and not enough <laughs> conversation about how you fatten it and how you encourage people to want to do that that work rather than feeling that their careers are at risk if they try and don't immediately succeed. Thank you. Well, on this issue about um, incentivising, um, we did a Twitter poll um, to support this debate. We, we, the, the, the poll question was, what would most incentivise you to move to a challenging school? So this was the teachers. Um, we had higher salary as one option and pro professional support as the second. 55% supported higher salary and 45% supported professional support. So I think we can see that probably 
probably both are important, um, but it just goes to show that in spite of what the research seems to suggest, this issue about um, uh, salaries certainly hasn't gone away and, and must be part of the, the mix, I suggest. Um, we've probably got just a time for one more round of questions, if we Here's keep our question. question. Oh, I'm so sorry, we've forgotten mental the mental health, health question. Yes, That's yes, really important. Just say I don't want you to be forgotten. Yes, really good point. Um, well done. Which is really, I should have said anything, because it, it's an area that I feel that I've failed in at my school on, a, on an almost daily basis, if I'm honest. Um, I remember sitting in my heart space, so we've got a big open central space last summer, and uh, talking to a year 11 young lady who I'd seen the day before, quite emotional and, and struggling, and somebody I knew well. And I said to her, um, as she walked past me, come have a chat, are you okay today? How, how's things? And she went, oh, it's great today, sir. The doctor doubled my antidepressants. She's 15. She's 15. My job is to filter that from her. My job is to filter that from my staff. And if I can't do that, then I'm failing them. Um, and somebody's failing me in the process, um, the system, whatever you want to call it. The, the trickle-down effects of stress, of anxiety, you know, of my own lack of sleep, and therefore people seeing that and the effect that has on me as a leader, and I have to model that that isn't the case, um, that's a challenge. And my, the announcements around um, how we are going to be at the forefront of helping adolescents with mental health as teachers frightens the hell out of me. You know, my staff are fantastic at noticing, noticing when things are going a bit wrong, noticing when a young person's not the, where they were three weeks ago, four weeks ago. They're great at noticing, but we can't solve. You know, we've got to have those clear outlets. Now, we've had a spot, um, a single point of contact for mental health for over a year now. The work she's been able to do by making connections with what's left of CAM services, what's left of mental health support, because she's a name that they know, she always phones, she always... And I think we probably get better than most schools in our area of service because of that. But as a system person, that means some other young person isn't getting it and that's not good enough. Um, so I, I think it's an area that we're, we're only minutes away, I think, from being in a, a baby so pee situation. So mental health um, services are an absolute disgrace. Yeah. It is genuinely disgraceful. We, we have a situation where, in lots of local authorities, 60% of young people are being turned down on referrals now, which is just not acceptable. And if you do get a referral, people are waiting six months, a year, longer, yeah. to, get, to get inadequate support. But don't we need, it's not, I mean, it, I agree entirely, I think we clearly need more resource in this area, but we also need to think more broadly as a society about, about mental health, because yeah. one of the things that's so noticeable is that this is not something that's um, where the privileged are protected. No. No. This is no respecter of privilege. Mm -hmm. You see it across the board, and it's saying something about the way that, you know, adolescence is experienced at the moment, that there's a kind of epidemic of mental yeah, health true for issues and I think well. that's one of the, the, the sort of fundamental question that we need to address not just how do we treat it but also what do we do to change it yeah. and uh, potentially increasingly how do we prepare teachers yeah. to well so, so increasingly teachers are, are, are you know we are coming from the generation that, that they're, they're experiencing mm. this and um, <coughs> are themselves not particularly equipped to, 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 to manage the stresses um, so as teacher trainers we need to think about how we get better at doing that as well so it's it, it's, it's a really big challenge right across the system. Thank you for the question, Amy. I suspect this could be another area for mm. debate another, yeah, another time. Um, we've got one uh, ch chance for just a couple more questions. We keep them short and keep the answers brief. So we've got one at the front and one at the back. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for those presentations. I think there was uh, nothing there that I, that I would take issue with. But I, I wonder whether we need to think uh, a little bit more radically about some things, whether it's the nature of the school day or the nature of the teacher's year or you know, some, some more radical blue skies thinking to address these very real issues. Several of you have pointed to the importance of recruitment and retention and the difficulties. Uh, oh, I'm Peter Early, by the way. I, I also work here. Um, we know from research that the, the schools that need the best teachers and the best leaders very often end up with the opposite. Not always, but that's that, a lot of research, both Becky Allen and, and also previously from the Teacher Development, Teacher Training Agency, has shown that. So my question really is, 
Um, <coughs> we talk about a labour market, but perhaps we ought to have more control over that labour market so that we can influence a bit more about where teachers are placed. At the moment, teachers leave challenging schools for a variety of reasons, usually workload, stress, uh, behaviour management, but also poor leadership and management and lack of support. Now, we really do need to address those four issues, and we're not doing that currently. Vic, you spoke earlier about a pool of applicants and schools would kind of pitch in for them and so on. Michael Wilshaw said before Christmas um, that there are so many teachers who are trained and then immediately go and work either in the independent sector or overseas in international schools. So there's a lot of, a lot of loss to the system. So maybe we need some golden handcuffs or something. We need some sort of fairly minor policy changes, but I think we also need some more radical thinking about how we can change the whole issue about recruitment and significantly retention. Thank At you, the moment, Lisa. our best teachers and leaders are in the leafy suburbs. We need them in the most challenging areas. Thank you, Peter. Good question. We one at the back. Hi. Um, my name's Pete. I'm from Football Beyond Borders. We're an education charity using football to engage young people. Um, I want to, this talk of mental health just now made me think back to the, the brief mention earlier of preschools um, or, you know, pre-reception age education, which I think is a, a key point here um, because both that and mental health really relate to experiences in the very earliest years of life. Um, in each case, we know that, we intuitively know that preventing adverse experiences in the earliest years is a kind of win-win situation whereby you um, reduce the risk of mental health issues later in life, and you also get a hold on this attainment gap that I can't remember the exact stats, but kind of it exists at what age three, and it only mm. gets worse. So I suppose so my question leading on from that is, um, what do we do about that, especially in a way that doesn't um, then uh, act as you know to the detriment of later life interventions as well? Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got um, the challenge to be more radical in terms of thinking about how we move capacity around the system, and we have a question on early years. We're doing a speedy yeah. response on both, saying I can completely see the attractions of a sort of Stalinist labour planning <laughs> market. Um, I'm just, I guess, realistic about the likelihood of it, it's being implemented in, in cu under current uh, conditions. And on preschool, yes, 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 we need actually, critically, it's something that we're looking at at the moment, um, critically needs government funding to be sort of sorted. At the moment, preschool and nursery funding was, is posited on uh, essentially a sort of election, uh, electioneering for working parent votes, not on the needs of the most needy children. Thanks, Lucy. Um, the, the preschool, um, comment for me it's about having a joined up approach it's we've got to have criminal justice has got to be talking to social care has got to be talking to education we can pinpoint these long-term disadvantaged families we know who they are we know who they are from the moment they walk through the door at nursery i know how many of my young people have currently got parents in prison i know that that's going to have a long-term effect on that young person and it if we know that even earlier, we can do something earlier. So it does come back down to investment, but it does come probably down to policy where they have to force that conversation to happen because that way we can pinpoint much more positive, direct uh, support you know, around those vocabulary-rich environments, around those stable environments, around those environments where learning can still happen at home, 80% of the time being at home, remember, at childhood. So for me, there's, there's a joined-up approach that needs to be there. Um, I'm all for Stalinist approaches, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. David. Um, yeah, some of the best teachers do teach in leafy suburbs, but some even better teachers teach in tough schools. Absolutely. 70% um, of sponsored academies have been inspected and are good and outstanding. They weren't all um, requiring improvement and failing, but a significant number were. They, we wouldn't have that statistic six years after that policy was introduced if that wasn't the case. I, I, I worry about the idea that we continually we, st we still continue to talk sometimes about what I call this missionary work of parachuting teachers from the south up to the north. Mm -hmm. work, work with the people that live in the north that believe in those communities that want to be there. That, that doesn't sound radical, but it kind of is, actually. And I think in the, uh, in the response to your question, um, 
the, the only thing I'd say, because I don't want to repeat what others have said, is I think we need something like a mental health charter of support and evidence that goes from early years to the age of 25, because I don't think we're sharing enough about what the strategies are at different pinch points in a young person's life. Um, right from the point at which they're preschool to when they're pre-parent themselves, or even by the age of 25, they are parents. I think that's the join-up that I think is missing. Thank you, David. And Sam? Uh, if you want Stalinism, you might only need to wait another year or two. It could be coming soon. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, I didn't say that. Um, so, uh, that I think se se seriously, um, on, on that one, I think, um, rather than sort of ordering people around, which I don't think is, would work in our context, um, I think you, we could be doing more to create incentives to get people to work in the schools where we need them the most. I mean, I certainly agree with David that a lot of them already are. But um, if we really want to, if we really want to get people there, then um, the DfE have started to do things like um, helping with student loans, extra bonus payments. I think we need to be a m much more radical and ambitious on those. It's yeah. my national teacher service. Yeah, yeah, but but, but 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 rather it's the volunteer, than, not conscription. But, but really create strong incentives to do it. You know, if you go and work in one of these schools, you will get your whole loan repaid, or you know, you will get serious extra salary um, increments. And and to your poll, it's a bit of a myth that teachers don't care about salary. They do care about salary, um, and it would make a big difference. So um, so so I, I'd use incentives rather than rather than to tell people where to go. And um, on preschool, I don't have much. To beyond what the other panellists have said. I uh, agree with Vic, especially on, on what he was saying. Thank you so much. I mean, it does feel as though this is the real a start of a conversation <coughs> that's been enormously stimulating. Um, I suppose we don't have to be too Stalinist to think about, for example, France, where they do actively uh, position teachers and move them about. Um, so it's, it's, there's real scope for thought there. Um, but we've had lots of ideas, and as I say, both pragmatic and genuinely radical, I think. Um, we look forward to continuing the debate. Uh, but what more, I think, now than to thank you, the audience, for coming and your brilliant questions, and very much to our esteemed panel for coming and sharing their views. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you all at our next debate. Thanks for coming. Do, do, anytime.